It is 6.30, so I will call the meeting to the order. Could I have a motion for the adoption of a remote participation? Um, thank you. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> and we have a second um, discussion. Move to roll call. PM Nurse Acton, yes. Michael Ruderman Arlington, yes. Dave O'Connor Bolton, yes. Dave Ledoux Concord, yes. Ford Spalding Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone Lancaster, yes. Judy Clark Lexington, yes. Jeff Stuhlin Needham, yes. Alice Stuhlin Gusto, yes. Okay, thank you. And Michael, you have a visitor with us tonight. <laughs> Who, me? Oh. <laughs> Um, so we move to public comment. Um, Superintendent, did we receive any public comment for today's meeting? We have not. Okay. Moving on to for the good of the organization, I just want to remind everyone that our, um, our school committee uh, strategic planning retreat is coming up on April 1st, and we will be talking more about that later on in the agenda. Anyone else have anything that you'd like to add for the good of the organization? Judy. Um, I noticed on the MASC website today, there's a Vogue Tech division workshop on April 15th at 6 p.m. Thanks, Judy. Oh, I should, I have something maybe. Okay. Uh, oh, I was interviewed by WBZ today on Zoom uh, about our culinary arts collaboration with Arlington Eats and the Food Link folks. We don't know when it's coming on, but it was about a 10 minute interview. Oh, terrific. Did I see another hand? No. Okay. Yeah. And I, I do want to, um, you know, just the school has been getting a lot of good publicity in the local papers. And it's just really, really nice to see that. So good job. Okay, let's move on to superintendent's report. Board? Yes, sir. Um, building committee. We anticipate that after the April 19th spring break, um, we should have completed basically our four bunch list items that are been hanging on. Um, and then we can plant grass when it gets warmer. And when that starts coming up, we will be done with our building project as long as Lincoln agrees with us. Athletic field report, uh, they've stumped, there's a hill at the end of, uh, if you, when you drive by, there's a little knoll. Um, they've stumped that. They're now exposing whatever ledge there is. We're not sure what it is. Once we know how much, we'll know how to deal with it. Other than that, we're waiting for the weather to return to getting some warmth and being able to work out and field. That's it. Okay. Any questions for Ford? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, move on to the MIT accreditation visit. Yeah, I mentioned this before on uh, page three, four, and five of your packet is the uh, outline of the schedule where involved in this week with COA. Uh, we had a meet and greet meeting yesterday afternoon with the team leader who's from Georgia, along with two other team members um, from other parts of the country. Um, it's been going well. It's very strange to do it visually. <laughs> They're actually um, doing a records review and they'll ask for a record and Kim or Nancy holds it up in front of the camera and they say, okay, thanks. Um, they'll, they may be completed a day early, uh, but so far it's going very well. And uh, we look forward to getting through that. We've been anticipating this accreditation visit for literally years. Um, and it's gonna offer a lot of opportunity to our post-secondary students. Any questions about that? Co, Jennifer, you're muted. Yes, I am. So I just have a question. So. Is it a nationwide accreditation? Yes. Is that why? Okay, thank you. That's why there's so many people from out of state. All right. Yeah, I'll in help. the old days, it used it used to be the Department of Ed, our Department of Ed accredited 
our post-secondary institutions. And then that got pushed to NEASC that had a, a post-secondary career tech ed division. And then they got rid of that. And then this company out of Florida uh, or is now the one who does it. So for Massachusetts. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Any other uh, questions? Any other questions? Nope. Fall admissions, uh, Anthony, I've got a slideshow that I'll share and you can narrate and tell me what to do. Can you all see that? Yeah, I think so. Hold on. Take it away, Anthony. Sure, yep, so uh, another uh, banner year for admissions. Um, as you can see here, <clears throat> although maybe slightly down overall on applications up um, for our member town, so 270. Um, applications this year versus last year's 252. If you if you look down a little bit, and these this data is you know a few days old, but um, about a week old. But um, you know we're looking at a waiting list <clears throat> of probably about 80 80 or so students, with unfortunately probably around 25 of those being from um, our member towns. Uh, you can move forward here, Dr. B. Um, this is just a quick breakdown of the, the slot allotments um, based on the last two years of um, rolling admission, excuse me, ro enrollment, excuse me. Um, <laughs> and so here is just a breakdown of offers by town. Um, so we offered 201 students admission. Um, there was a tie right there. So we, you know, we knew it wouldn't come back at 200 and one, all of them. So, oh, sorry, go back one second there, Dr. V. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. And then 175 of those students uh, accepted our offer, which is a, uh, a really high number. It's, it's, it's pretty good. So we're happy with that. And so that was for our, what's it called? The February, the March 1st review. Um, and then the March 22nd review, which is the latest that we can offer admission um, for these 26 seats here. It's really 25, but um, this, this, extra seats that we have that reopened, um, we will offer that admission later this week um, to get ourselves back to our 200 number. <clears throat> uh, so this is just kind of a look at, you know, looking at um, how things, uh, you know, the, the change in enrollment um, for each member town. And you can see um, just from last year to this year, obviously the class is larger, uh, but you can also see just um, from a town by town perspective, um, the increase um, in, those, in those member communities with, I think, a, a, an interesting and key piece of information down at the bottom there, which is that that's the percentage of the school that is going, is constituted as member town. So um, our current, you know, our current school is 73%, which, um, is significantly up from what it had been historically. And then next year, if all things go as they are right now, um, it'll be an increase of over 80% of member town um, students. And this is just um, a quick, this is what it will maybe look like. Uh, again, this is just, <clears throat> um, this was done again a week ago, um, but just a projected you know, the kids who were on the quote unquote waiting list, but really the, the in-district students who were not offered admission in the first round, but are eligible in the second round. Uh, this is just, you know, what I projected as potentially, you know, how many kids would get in um, from each town on that run. It, it has changed a little bit, but that's, it's still pretty close to what, um, what's there. And this, this is just a quick look at out of district. So you can see that overall in, in this overall drop accounts for the, the, the kind of, you know, the difference in total applications for the year, but you know, it's down and it's mainly because of Belmont. Belmont had um, uh, a number of applications in the previous year and is significantly down uh, this year. Um, so um, with the most common towns that we're seeing is Watertown still strong, um, 25 applications with, Foxborough, Belmont, and Waltham also um, coming in with a number of applications. Is that, yeah, there we go. That That's was the last of the admission slides. Any questions for Anthony? I have a, um, a um, question slash comment. Uh, I just want to point something out. Uh, uh, so Anthony and Dr. Boquilla, 
we decided to uh, increase the class size this year to 200 students, mm -hmm. which is representative of a school of 800 students and not one of 628. Mm -hmm. If we had not done this expansion of uh, our thinking in terms of the size of the school, here's an easy math question. How many in-district students about what do we now have on our waiting list? A lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, another, uh, uh, like another 40 or so, right? Correct. So it'd be like 70 or 80. Mm -hmm. So everybody should keep that number in mind, how, um, uh, how it gets you to think. If mm -hmm. we hadn't decided less than a year ago to pursue expanding the school to 800 students, we would now have 70 or 80 students from within the district on a waiting list. Mm -hmm. so just keep that in mind when, you, um, when we continue along here and I'll have a few comments on it uh, later. That's a, that's a thought that's uppermost in my mind when I um, look at these reports. And Jeff, one just I'll throw this last piece here, but um, one thing to remember in terms of that what you just said there, we didn't do half of what we normally do in recruitment. We didn't have a showcase day. We had a small open house, um, and we didn't go to the schools to present. And that's and this is the number that we had. So once we do that next year, I mean, at a minimum, I would assume I would hope that it would stay the same, but it very well could. Um, increase. And if I had told the school committee members this, including myself three years ago, they would have locked me up. I believed it all along. <laughs> this I mean, fast, it, not this fast. I didn't believe it. I oh, no, I, it. I, I, I expected it year one. I mean, the reality was we, we knew we were building a smaller school than, than anticipated. And, and the reality is, is this is exactly what we we, we have, I mean, um, it's a fantastic facility and, you know, you get a brand new shiny facility with, with uh, all sorts of great programs. Everybody wants to come there. So no surprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you, Dave. And unless there's some more questions, that's a good segue into our next item. Yeah. So building capacity, I'll just give you an update on where we're at with that. And you notice there is a vote, one of the, and I'll talk about that when we get to it, but we have three projects in mind at the moment and they're in, a, in priority order, number one, two, and three. Number one, as I've mentioned before, um, the North Building Foundation, which is there, um, can be expanded into a shop extension, sort of like a satellite shop right outside the metal fab welding area. Um, that would allow us to add more students when that's completed. Um, the second satellite building renovation is the Tremont School, which I've talked about before. That would house, not this coming year, but in the years after would house our veterinary clinic, um, a vet lab, um, classroom space, conference room space, and additional classrooms, because the classroom bottleneck is going to be the challenge when it comes to adding 800 or even going over 800 a bit. Um, we had to follow MSBA guidelines for that 628 enrollment, uh, design enrollment. And although we had some creative leeway with the shop space, we did not have that creative leeway with the classroom space. And so that's what's limiting us. The third project is the South Building Foundation, which uh, we're calling a solar innovation site and a maintenance building. There's currently maintenance equipment stored in the school that could go out to that building and by um, you know, default, we would gain more square footage inside the building. It doesn't have a big impact on the actual number of kids, but just number one and two easily gets us 100 more kids, um, probably more than that, but I wanna be conservative right now. So the solar innovation site would be a combination of, of uh, construction 
CMUs, as actually they're called SMUs now, solar uh, masonry units. Um, and our students would be involved in building that um, building. And that's the last of the priorities. Just to give you an idea of the, of the uh, where we are, are at with the number one priority is, um, this is a timeline which shows uh, design starting in May. Some design has started already, but, and then going through the same process we would go through with any kind of a project, uh, permitting, procurement. Um, there's some ex some uh, stuff we would hire out, obviously, but then there's some student performed work as well. Basically electrical, HVAC, uh, some carpentry. And this would become an on-site campus project for those trades. Um, and it also keeps the price down. We've done some initial pricing of this particular project with the total cost being about 785,000 with, with contingencies, with escalation, with all the other kinds of soft costs you put into a, a construction project. Um, this will give us about 1200 square feet, which doesn't sound like much, but when you realize that it's a full functioning shop that meets all the code requirements, meets all the other uh, construction requirements, um, that's a pretty good price per square foot, actually. When you figure this building was, I think, $554 a square foot. Um, so I don't, we don't have a real timeline and cost for the second project yet. That's still in sort of conceptual design. Um, I can mention that we are in progress with Blue Pearl Veterinary Partners. Um, they actually sent me a letter today and Solablock, which is a company in, based in Massachusetts that has got all the patents on this SMU, Solar Masonry Unit. Um, and we've actually gotten a grant with Solablock through the Massachusetts, um, I think it's Department of Energy and Conservation, uh, where Minuteman is, is helping Solablock develop the training materials for electricians, and masons um, to install solar block properly. So that's just getting off the ground. Um, the new climate bill may give us some more opportunity, the state climate bill. I don't, I don't remember if that's been signed. It was originally vetoed <clears throat> and then it was resubmitted to the governor. And I, we hear he's gonna sign it, but that would give us some more opportunity to create a, a solar block demonstration area. And I gotta mention, that this whole uh, demonstration area would be behind the meter. In other words, the solar block wouldn't be contributing anything to our uh, reduction of our electrical bill because we've got a contract already with the other company who's putting this, the solar uh, panels up on the roof. So it would be just be to power that building and we could have a lot of, uh, make it a very educational kind of place too, as well as a functional storage uh, facility. Um, we've got a, we're, we're a week away from submitting a, a Massachusetts Capital Skills Grant for 1.5 million, 500,000 of that, or roughly maybe 600 uh, would go towards the final phase of expanding our logistics engineering uh, program, which would also add capacity because the toil lab would then become a lab that's occupied by kids every day, as well as the warehouse space. Um, so that's on top of the 100 kids that the other two projects do. And in that capital skills grant, the, the, almost a million dollars were putting a uh, request in for our veterinary assisting and our health assisting programs. Um, we have our capital stabilization fund, which in FY22, We'll have about 350,000 in it. Federal and state grants, as, as uh, Alice and I were talking about beforehand, the, the latest uh, COVID relief package has quite a bit of money coming to uh, Massachusetts. So we're hopeful there's some opportunity there. And then whenever the infrastructure. Um, so I think we can, we're not gonna have to go borrow for this is my intention. Uh, we're not gonna add any expenditures to the towns 
Um, I think we're going to be able to do it with the resources we have over three fiscal years. Okay. So that's that. Okay. So any questions about what I've spoken to so far? Uh, Jennifer. Just a quick comment. I, I think it's, we cannot borrow for this. We've promised at least I, we were, you know, at Lancaster's meeting and, and we promised this is not something we would add additional costs to the member towns. So I think it's very important that we keep that promise because we've, we've gotten stuff from them that I did not necessarily expect, so. Judy? I second what Jennifer just said. Um, I'm excited about this project. Uh, just, a, and you may not know the answer of this yet. So for building number one, the North building, do you anticipate um, entry into this building? Do you have to go outside to enter the building or is it gonna be um, attached to the main it's a separate building. Separate building. Okay. Yep. Thank you. On a pre existing foundation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Michael? Yeah, thank you, Pam. Um, have uh, transit times between between uh, one, two, and three, especially the, the, the Tremont School building, been, been factored into how their academic schedules would work? No. We haven't done any academic scheduling yet. Okay. Looks like it would be a pretty good walk. Uh, Ford? Oh, I'm sorry. Mine's simple. Um, could uh, Julia please send out the PowerPoints for both the admissions and your presentation, Ed? Because I don't think they were not the same as in the packet that was sent out. No, these are right up to date to today. Right. So yeah. if we could send those out, that'd be great. Oh, thank you, Ford. What's your email address for it? I never I used had no it. idea. Ed. You, <laughs> you can hand deliver it. <laughs> or I'll come up. <laughs> Any other questions? So the first step in this is that we have to treat it as a separate project. So we have to follow all the proper procurement guidelines and we have to do a, a designer selection process. So the vote that's in your packet tonight is to um, really just appoint the designer selection committee as recommended. Um, and you may recall, um, some of you may or may not, we did this a few years ago with our engineering consultants, Gale Engineering, where we went through an engineering selection process. And once they go through this vetting process, they become our engineers on call. So if we have an issue, we don't have to go through a whole bidding process. We can just give them a call. They <laughs> adhere to the rates that they put in the bid and uh, we get the, it just saves months of time. Um, so we wanna be able to do this with designer services as well. Okay. Um, can we have a, a motion to appoint the, an on-call architectural designer selection committee? So moved. So moved. Second. Okay. okay, with the membership as outlined in the um, in the mid and on the agenda, um, do we have um, any discussion or questions? Um, Alice, <laughs> um, can you outline the um, initial costs associated with it, if there are any? With the getting the designers. You mean? Yeah. Um, is there and any? It's just the cost. There's no cost except for publishing it, as we would any other kind of uh, procurement process. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's move to a roll call vote. Hamner second yes. Michael Ruderman Arlington yes. Dave O'Connor Bolton yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding, Dover, yes. Uh, Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer? Oh, I saw, sorry. I said Jennifer Leone Lancaster, yes. I was in the unmute. Judy Clark, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen, Needham, yes. Oh, Stulen, yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much.
Okay, the general advisory uh, board meeting update. Well, I'm going to um, put uh, team member Dave O'Connor on the spot since he was at the last okay, general great. advisory board member. He has five minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so the general advisory board um, meeting um, met last Tuesday, uh, Thursday. Um, and uh, Ed provided um, a, a, a essentially the same presentation um, to the, uh, the the advisory board. Um, trying to think, I, I don't have any in my notes, Ed. So, uh, well, it was um, just it's our regular couple times a year we get together yeah. and meet. Um, there's there's suggestions about what we should be focusing on. There was a lot of good. Um, well, people are pretty excited about how things are going, I guess, and uh, especially some of the expansion with the new programming and the new, uh, you know, the final phase of the engineering expansion, too. So I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Dave. You did fine. Thank you. No, that's fine. It's just, <laughs> give me a heads up next time. I'll bring my notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. That concludes the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to principal's report. Uh, George. Okay, first, as you know, March 1st, we increased in-person learning. We added another class into the building. So we now have two classes in the building at all times. One group, one grade is in CTE like they have been. The other group is in academics. Um, we were shooting originally for a February date for that, but there's just a lot of logistics. It was really like winding the year back to August and trying to figure out, you know, start from scratch really with all the regulations and make them work. Um, so Dr. Boquillen um, could kind of sense that from us, you know, that we were <laughs> trying, but we weren't really gonna be really ready. Uh, but the March 1st, you know, it's it's been great, <laughs> how else to put it. Um, I think we were nervous about how it would work. Kids have been fantastic. Teachers' response has been tremendous. Um, I think there's a sense of relief, really, to be working with the kids, to see them, the academic teachers, to, to get to see the kids. Um, you know, we had a young lady today. It was her first day because uh, she decided, after watching class one more time on Monday, decided that she wanted to be in person and, uh, you know, so I'm bringing her down to her class and her teachers in the hallway and, you know, and I just got his attention. He says, oh yeah, I know who she is. But it's like old friends who've never met. He's like, we've never actually met, but I've seen you all the time. Come on in. And it was just, you know, one of those nice little moments for that girl who was nervous to feel like, oh, you know, so, um, but generally the response from teachers is, uh, is very positive. They just, I love, just almost feel at peace again, like just seeing kids and working with them. So all the things that we were worried about, they don't really materialize, <laughs> you know, everything went smoothly. Um, mm -hmm. so, and, and we have a strong team. That's, that's really what it comes down to. And we have great teachers there. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions about that. Oh, uh, yes, lots of questions. Oh, we boy. have Jennifer, <laughs> Jeff, and Steve. Okay. So just a quick question. Where are we with getting our teachers vaccinated? Is that? Oh. Um, actually, Sorry. <laughs> teachers have been, we've had, so, I was going to put a little bit of that under the MPA report. Um, we had a few parent, uh, volunteers from the MPA who actually were helping out in Acton to help those teachers get vaccination appointments. So they've helped out. Uh, teachers are, you know, it's just a talk around the building. People are all over the place trying to get their appointments. So it's, it's happening. We're trying to help out. We had um, Mr. Donato uh, was able to help a few people get hooked up this week. So he's been, you know, so it's all, all hands on deck. Everyone's trying to help each other get those appointments and it's, and it's happening all throughout the building. Thank you. Okay, Jeff. Uh, so when is the um, commissioner making you go to 100%? <laughs> and uh, how, how are we going to, um, how happy are we about that at this time? I'll take that if you'd like, George. Sure. <laughs> sure. 
Well, our hope is that we get another class in for CTE. And uh, so we'd have full CTE in person for the kids. One we one in person academic, and then the uh, other academic week will be remote. And I'm pretty sure that's how Minuteman is going to end the year. So you don't think that these uh, that the uh, commissioner is going to somehow magically insist that all the high schools go to 100% by a a particular date? Is that's what I've heard? Is that they're trying to do? I think I've described how I expect Minuteman to end the year. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, Steve. Uh, Jennifer asked my question. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, Jeff asked mine. Judy, did you have your hand up? I thought I saw it. Nope. Any, any other questions before we move on to the school calendar? Okay. Great. Uh, the school calendar, you have a draft in the packet, and it's just a draft. We still have to add a couple of um, contractual things with the union. The union really hasn't, you know, given it a, a look over, but it is a draft. It's in good faith, so you can see that we're working on it. Um, I'm actually having a meeting tomorrow to work on some more of the dates, you know, and uh, I'd love to get the MCAS testing dates for next year, but I, I'm not even sure what they'll be for this spring, <laughs> to be honest. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know if those will make it. Um, we'll, we'll try to get them on there. But uh, just so that you can see, there is a draft in action. And hopefully we'll have something more concrete in the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, Katie, are you uh, baby free? Yes, yes, I am. Oh, OK. <laughs> I just That's went okay. to bed. We like seeing you too. Oh, good. I'm not as much fun, though. Um, so with the skills, um, we did really well at skills this year. So although they were held virtually, uh, Minuteman was one of 13 other high schools for District 3. Um, we had 32 students participate in virtual online exams, including their respective vocational areas and employability tests and a safety test. Uh, we got 18 medals. Uh, we had six gold, seven silver, and five bronze. Uh, we had 12 students continuing on to states. Uh, nine in-person competitions are going to be happening at Blackstone Valley, and we're going to have three of those students are doing online submissions. And of the 14 competition categories we participated, we medaled in 11 of them. Mm. Uh, cabinet making swept all three medals, um, and all three were sophomores, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so we're really looking forward to states. It's cool that we are able to do some type of hybrid model where we're busing kids in, uh, so they will be doing the majority of those in person. Well, congratulations. Thanks, yeah, it is awesome. exciting. Awesome. Uh, very impressive. Um, okay, and the Minimum Parent Association update. Um, like I said, they've, um, Ms. Aberoff and Bloomberg over there have really helped us out with uh, shots. Uh, the MPA is very responsive. We had a student who uh, lost her home in a fire uh, two weeks ago. And that was one of the first phone calls I made, which was to the MPA. And within an hour, they had already issued a $200 gift card to the family to, um, to help them buy some food uh, as they were in the process of relocating. So they've been tremendously generous that way. You know, we're working through our scholarships uh, with the MPA right now as well for the kids. They've hosted a town hall uh, last month with Dr. B and myself and uh, I'll probably do another one with them at the end of the month. And uh, they've called about teacher appreciation. They're already thinking about that, which is awesome. Um, so it, it, we've had a, had a good run, good stretch of weeks with the, with the Parents Association. A lot of uh, very supportive and uh, very pro Minuteman and, and very effective in everything that they do. Well, I, I know I really appreciate having that on the agenda and getting an update. So thank you. Any questions for George? Okay, let's move on to finance report. Um, let's see. Oh, well, well Alice. Um, does the family need any ongoing support that was in that had the fire? Yeah, they, they're going to need it. Um, you know, just from my talking to 
you know, people about this uh, incident, you know, they talk a lot about people who have been through it, um, have said that, you know, and, and that the, um, with the Red Cross that usually there's this big up, outpouring in the very beginning. And then as the weeks go on, people forget, but they still need a little bit of help. So, um, you know, we, we, we're still doing fundraisers uh, this week to, to get some, some, a little bit more money. And then, um, you know, we'll talk about with the family, how they want us to distribute to them and what, what their real needs are, if it's cash or, you know, would they like to give cards again or what their real needs are. But yeah, I can see that it will be ongoing and we'll keep an eye on, on the family, uh, you know, just great kid. She's just awesome. And uh, get a lot of, a lot of people looking out for her. So if members of the school committee wanted to contribute to your fundraising, what would they do? Um, an easy way to, you know, people have done it uh, in different ways. Um, you know, I've had people just drop off gift cards to the main office and, you know, we get them up to Sonia Vitrano and she, you know, records them. Some people want to be anonymous, so they just give it to me and I, you know, I'll give the, whatever it is, the cash or the gift card to, to Sonia. So those are, those are the two main ways. Friday, they'll do the bake sale at school. Um, just for reference, we did it last week, two different days, and we sold out everything. And, um, you know, the kids and even, you know, you can see it in the faculty, they're buying a $1 brownie and leaving $19 in the other container for the, you know, that kind of stuff. So you can come by Friday if you want. <laughs> we'll just do a temperature check to let you in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for asking Alice, but, but it sounds like if, this, if school committee members wanted to help um, getting a gift card in some way um, to you might be the best way. Okay, thank you. Okay, finance report. Um, our, Steve, are you kicking us off? Sure. Uh, the Finance Committee met on March 1st, and the main uh, presentation discussion we had was about the uh, uh, kind of the final uh, uh, bond financing for the, the school project and adding into that uh, the field project. So uh, we have about uh, $4.8 million of bonding to be done for the remainder of the school project and adding in uh, 1.9 million for the for the field. So uh, the strategy is to borrow uh, $6.7 million uh, sometime in April and hopefully lock in some really good rates. So that was pretty much our main discussion at the, uh, the last finance committee meeting. Okay, any questions for Steve? Yeah, I'll just mention we've got a uh, Bob and Kevin and I have a meeting with Standard and Poor's tomorrow around our bond rating. They have a series of questions and we prepped today with the um, our financial consultant. Uh, so we think we're going to be uh, in pretty good shape. And the good thing about Standard and Poor's is uh, they know a lot about Massachusetts and Massachusetts finance laws as opposed to Moody's. So generally they're, they're more favorable rating. So you should do well. Mm. <laughs> oh, I, the, it's the next thing, me. Yeah, you'll see on page 23 where Ed, I- Actually, Ed, I think I saw another hand. Um, Alice, do you have a question? Uh, do we know roughly what the rates are like these days? I asked Lynn that today and she said the, the actual real true interest rate is, is a little under 2%. Okay. All right. And, I, and I think in our, our projection, particularly with the field project, I think we were using like 2.75% or something like that. Does that sound At right? At least that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think we'll be okay. Oh yeah, we'll actually, we'll recover. She was talking about a premium for that amount of almost 400,000 on a 6.7 bond, four to maybe 500,000, which we would apply to the principal because we can't really keep it or spend it for anything else. So um, that is gonna reduce our payment as well. Okay, great. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. So um, I've been to some meetings uh, and the reason I'm putting this in here is to remind you 
that if you need me at a meeting to let me know, let Julia know. I think I'm at the Lexington town meeting next Wednesday. Wednesday, thank you in advance. Yes, Wednesday. The 24th. Yes. It's, and uh, Needham, we're gonna be doing like we did in Lexington. We'll do a videotape of the presentation, a videotape or whatever you call it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a movie, how's that? And uh, I've been getting questions from people in Lexington, Judy. Yeah, I looped you into those. So it's kind of neat. They can ask her questions after they listen to it. We answer them and it should make the meeting go even smoother. So I think I've been to every place at least once. So I would say that your uh, the canned part of your presentation to Needham had a astonishing amount of information in a very little period of time, even more so than in most years because of all the things we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I found that very impressive. And I think that the, the people who were there at that meeting found it impressive as well as how much you uh, uh, put into that um, fairly short presentation. Great, so keep us in the loop about any meetings prior to town meeting. And uh, so I know some have town meeting schedules that are a little bit in flux. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I am, uh, the chair approved me to go on vacation. So I'm, I'm going to be gone till July. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> well, last, last part of April for a week. Um, okay, that's all I have. Do, I do have one question on town meetings. Uh, my assumption is that this year we won't have any trouble uh, getting our budget done by the deadline mm. because of crazy scheduling of town meetings like we were on the nail biter last year. Would that be uh, true as far as we can see? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, other questions? Okay, move on to the um, list of donations. Thank you, This uh, and good evening. This agenda item is for the school committee to review the list of donations less than $5,000 pursuant to policy DDA section A paragraph two. This month, we have received a significant amount of donations for our scholarships, and we thank all of the donors for their generosity. So tonight, I'd like the school committee to, uh, to ask the school committee to vote to approve the monthly list of donations. So moved. Moved. Second. Second. Any questions? Okay, um, we'll go on to roll call vote. Governor Saxon, yes. Michael Ruderman, Arlington, yes. Dave O'Connor, Bolton, yes. Steve will do Concord, yes. Or it's falling Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Judy Clark, Lexington, yes. Jeff Stula, Needham, yes. Alice Chalukas, so yes. Okay, thank can you. I, can I ask a brief question? Uh, Bob, do, do we appropriately fall all over ourselves in thanking uh, big donors like DCU for 10 grand and such? Uh, we can send letters to them, yeah. Is that enough? Uh, they ought to get some real hometown, um, you know. You know, you know <laughs> I know happy. our policy says we really can't write them like a receipt, um, but I'm not sure what the past practice has been other than a thank you. Can we send them something from the bake sale? <laughs> <laughs> Brownies. Yeah. No, I was talking oh. about a press release. Oh. Well, I normally that would happen when these scholarships are awarded. And okay. the students themselves, uh, the teacher, the advisors work with the kids to write thank you letters directly to the funders when they receive the funds. Maybe I'm not being clear here. I'm talking about something that can run in there in DCU's, uh, you know, you know, you know, uh, towns of principal business endeavors. Uh, some some good news for them and for their board members to read. Yeah, I'll talk to Dan about it. The thank communications you. director. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, acknowledgement is important. Thank you. Um, moving and, on to and, and the public recognition that comes from this sort of corporate generosity. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's powerful. Um, yes, and, and appreciated. So thanks. Uh, Strategic Planning Committee. Thank you, Pam. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody uh, for meeting with Jeff Lawrence and Steve. Um, you all spent some time with them. We do not know the results uh, as of yet, but um, I'm really, we're very appreciative that that was done. Tomorrow evening, um, 
Pam and Alice and I are meeting with our consultant, Jeff Lawrence, um, about the strategic uh, planning retreat that we're gonna have on, as Pam said, April 1 and April 8. I hope you both save both of those. And it's gonna be 7 to 7.30 to um, 9 uh, at the max. So that's, that's our plan. Um, we'll only go to the 12th of, uh, to the 8th if we need to, but uh, please reserve it. Hopefully after tomorrow evening, uh, we'll have a pretty good idea of uh, what we're gonna be doing at the retreat. And that's up to Jeff is putting that together and we'll get information out to you as soon as possible. But, um, so there'll be more to come. And uh, again, thank you for meeting with us. Okay, any questions um, about the upcoming retreat? Okay, looking forward to seeing you all there. Okay, Communication Access and Admission Subcommittee. So we uh, have, uh, we're, we're really running ahead of schedule today. So I figured that I have, I could take 50 minutes for this report since we're doing so well on time. No, no, okay. Just, just <laughs> two ideas for you. One, which was a, a very interesting one that occurred last night. The first idea is that, um, the things we are working on this year, I'm just reminding you, are uh, ex the expansion issue, how to increase diversity, making sure all our member towns understand the value of the education that we have, and the possible inclusion of one more uh, town in our district. So even though we're spending all this time on uh, primarily on the expansion, these are the major things that we're uh, talking about. Now, the thing that came up that was very interesting last night at um, uh, the Needham, Needham has a, uh, a subcommittee to study Minuteman and it meets uh, twice a year and Ed and I and um, others attend it. And what happened this year is Needham was allocated 11 slots and um, 11 kids in the first round and 11 kids applied and uh, they were, one of them didn't want to come. And uh, John Connolly, a member of the finance committee was a little bit concerned about that. He was concerned because what will it mean for the number of slots they have available next year if Needham doesn't have all its slots filled this year? So if you're limited, now that we're in this new reality, of having a waiting list. Issues that we may not have completely anticipated are coming up. And I think we need to gather all these issues as they come up this year and then take a, another look at how we're doing things because it's a real concern because one kid not deciding to take their slot, they may have fewer slots in a future year which begs the question is one way to solve this to look at not just how many kids are coming, but also how many have applied and gone through the entire cycle. So if you have a big increase in one town in which the membership, the number of kids who want to come goes up by quite a bit, but they're stymied because the previous year they didn't have a lot of kids coming, that could uh, lead to a lot of frustration. So I'm saying that we need, I think we need to do two things. One is of course, listen to all of our member towns on their concerns on this year, take notes on all of it, and then go back and look at the policies we've put together to see if they are uh, uh, correct, still correct as we originally decided them, or maybe there's a little bit of room uh, for some leeway. I think we have to consider that. And the other thing we have to consider is, um, well, actually, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Leave it at the point in which we need to uh, look at this stuff very carefully. It is a new world for us now, and we have to be sensitive to, the, to that fact that it is a new world and our member towns who never thought about any trouble with um, slots at Minuteman before may have a different point of view now. And in this case, they got a little bit, you know, very concerned about this issue. 
So uh, that was my experience in the Needham meeting last night. And I assume that in all your communities, when they get the news about whether all their students could get in or not, might hear some similar ideas. That's really all I have to say. And is that a question from Dave? Yeah, so um, isn't the uh, enrollment a, um, a weighted average over multiple years? Just two years. That and, could change. Yeah, you know, I was going to say. So maybe, so, so maybe, maybe what we look at is is having a rolling three year average or something like that, so that if you have an anomaly in one year, the other two years flatten it out. Or if you have multiple years of a downward trend, it would wait and and do it. But just a thought. Yep. Yep. Think Alice. Um, the admissions policy only requires that we have a slot allocation for the minimum number of students per town, not the maximum number. It only says minimum. And the reason for that is to ensure that every member town that's paying for the building gets at least some of their students into the school. That's the only thing that we have as a policy regarding this. The administration is supposed to come to the school committee each year with how they're going to do the slot allocation for a minimum number of students. Mm -hmm. And I think the related idea would be that um, we need to develop a document which describes this process in very simple language for the uh, mm -hmm. member town officials who are looking at it. And uh, it would be, and, and one part of this document should be the fact that in when we give kids a score as to where they fit on the list of how we accept them, a very important thing that we do that not all communities do is we have five categories that we, is that right, um, Dr. Bahut, five categories that we weigh equally. And some of the communities who don't do it that way, who don't weigh them equally, have gotten some complaints from the state. And the way that we do it is, uh, I think most people will think that it is more fear than uh, other ways. And the purpose of this, of course, is to match the students who are most appropriate for this education. And I do think the way we do it by having the five categories that are weighted equally does give us some of our argument of fairness. And I think that we may have to have this argument of fairness um, if there is some um, controversy about the number of slots that are available to each community. And these are the sorts of things we're gonna to have to think about for the future. But I do think we have a good story. And I think that we should tell it in a way that uh, people can understand. Alice? I just think this is a great discussion. And um, yeah. Uh, Jennifer. So I'd like part of this discussion to be for the slot allocation, a somehow to, to factor in the number of eighth grade students in the pool. Um, because if it's just based on the last couple of years of enrollment, you know, Lancaster is gonna keep paying more than it can afford. Um, I think 20% of our eighth graders, 15% of our eighth graders are going. So if we can have something that says a slot allocation for 5% and then what kids don't make it in, then go into the next round. I, I don't know, I just, I, we need to even it out a little bit more because it's going to take a lot of years for the Lancaster enrollment numbers to come down so that we can actually afford to stay in this district. I think that um, in my view, we wait a few more months to find out you know, what the actual admissions is going to be and the comments from our various member towns. And then perhaps the, uh, the uh, Communication Access and Admissions Subcommittee can start looking at this issue and see if we need some revisions to our policy uh, as mentioned by some of the members here today. Uh, 
But so when we talk to people, we should also say that, you know, we understand that this is not perfect. This is the first year that our, our, this part of our policy is being tested. We did the best we can in setting this up ahead of time. We know it's not perfect. And we're gonna take your comments and we're gonna consider revising the policy in the future. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of what I, what I felt like saying when I heard this comment come out of the blue from a finance committee member. And of course that, that concern is perfectly legitimate. Jennifer's concern is perfectly legitimate. And so I think we can come up with a, uh, a better approach to this, but I think we have to wait another few months and gather some more comments before we do so. And then uh, this, the uh, communication subcommittee will take a look at it and then we'll bring it in front of the full school committee. And I don't think we need a vote for us to do that because I see enough nodding that this may be a good approach good approach so unless anybody objects to it i think that that's um how we but should I, also, I don't think this is a one-year thing anyways i mean i think it's a multi-year we're going to face this thing every year and refine it and make it better i think it will be multi-year but i think that after one year we can make a lot of improvements to it. okay yeah yeah so so the so i think what you're saying jeff is you know we'll gather kind of feedback you know, from our towns on this year, committee will work on it, bring something back. Um, I, I just want to check an assumption that we, um, that I have, uh, um, and going back to our earlier discussion about increasing enrollment capacity. This is a particularly um, difficult time right now because it's the first time that, you know, our member towns are on you know, are having students on a, a wait list. Um, if assuming we're moving forward with our with the plans that um, Dr. Bequillen laid out today for increasing um, member enrollment, that you know these issues are going to be particularly acute for maybe another two or three years. That doesn't mean that they'll go away, but particularly acute for another another two or three years. These other plans are moving forward. Is that about the right time frame? Oh, I think it's unclear if if this is really the new normal that you're going to have 50 yeah. kids every year who are on a wait list. We don't know if that's really the number moving forward. We don't know if it's going to go up. We don't know if it's going to come down. If we add another town, another member town, then that may change the numbers as well. Right. So. You have to be very careful about this discussion that you're having. You can't ask for um, changes in the slot allocation formula and then expect a new town to move in and get nine um, unanimous votes for that new member to come in. So you're going to have to look at it financially. Uh, the financial analysis is, hasn't been mentioned here, and it's a very significant one. By increasing the number of member town students, we're going to be increasing the chapter 78 that goes to each of the towns that helps offset the assessments. So to look at it only on the expenditure side is um, not a good analysis. We have to look at it on the revenue side as well. And then you also have to look at the four to four to eight year impact of adding a new member such as Watertown. There may be some acute uh, like we're experiencing in FY22 and 23 and with the bond peaking. Um, so I think it needs a financial analysis, not just a political one. It's a good thing we have a lot of really smart people available on the school committee and the administration to handle mm -hmm. this kind of That's right. complicated, complicated matter. So and you're talking about a full cost benefit analysis. I think it would, yeah, if you're going to make a decision about this, you have no, to. I think that's that. smart. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Alice, was your hand, I think I saw your hand up. As, um, I just wanted to uh, pick up on something Jennifer said that if you, whoops, it says I'm muted. Hmm. Um, uh, what, something that Jennifer said, which was related to the percentage of the eighth grade students. As the school was configured at 628, 
as of last year, between six and 7% of the eighth grade of each town, there would be room for that many kids from each town to go to the school. If it was even across all towns, six to 7%, something around those numbers would be able to come to Minuteman out of the eighth grades. So that gives you a sense if you were to smooth it over all of the member towns, that is what you would be looking at. Okay. That's the end of my report. Okay, well, you know, we'll be having, you know, lots of further discussion. So, okay, let's move on to secretary's report, Alice. I did not receive any comments on the minutes of February 9th. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of February 9th? So moved. Second. Um, any, uh, any discussion? Okay, let's do a roll call vote. Pam Nurse Acton, yes. Michael Ruderman Arlington, yes. Okay, Dave, I, you're on mute, but um, I think you were just voting. Dave O'Connor, Bolton, abstain. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Parker Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen Needham, yes. Alice Stulkusto, yes. Okay, thank you. Can do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, we'll do our roll call again. Pam Nurse Acton, yes. Michael Ruderman Arlington, yes. Dave O'Connor Bolton, yes. Steve Ledoux, Concord, yes. Ford Spalding, Dover, yes. Jennifer Leone, Lancaster, yes. Clark of Lexington, yes. Jeff Stulen Needham, yes. Al Lucas Joe, yes. Thank you, everyone. And we will see you all on April 1st. <laughs>